Hey, Grace. How are you guys doing? It's so good to see you guys. I'm glad you can see me now. Uh, so, hey, um, glad you guys are here today. Open your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, as you're doing that, let me tell you some really exciting things that are happening right now. Uh, we, uh, God is doing all kinds of things in the church, and we are so grateful. He is so merciful and so good, and he is just pouring out his love on our church right now. And one of the ways is that the church is just kind of exploding in growth, and, uh, and that's a wonderful uh, challenge for to ha- us to have, but nevertheless, it's a challenge. And so here's what I'm uh, going to tell you. Uh, on Easter, uh, we are going to have, we are going to have um, an additional service, right? We're going to have five services, and so we're actually, five services, or how many? Six, six services. We're going to have six services on Easter. I'll show up for however many there are, and uh, it's going to be great. But here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're actually going to uh, keep one of those services. So we're going to have five services after that. We're going to add an additional Sunday morning service at 815, okay? And so really excited about that. Yes. Yeah, you should do that. Like, that's a good thing, right? Now, listen, and here's the reason why it's good for you, because you're coming early. Like, the lazier people in the next service, they're not, they're not as smart and beautiful as you guys are. And so, so, here, so, here's, so here's what I want to encourage you. Here's what I want to encourage you with. I want to encourage you that if you're like more of an early morning person, man, come to the 815 service. Here's the reason why. This service and the next service are the, ser- the services that are the most easy for us to fill up. And so here's what we've done. Over the last several months, we've been moving people from this service and the next service. The next service is at least 115% full, right? So we've been moving people from this service and the, the, the next service to Saturday nights. And Saturday nights are filling up nicely. They're doing really, really well. It's been awesome. Every single time we take one of you out of these seats, someone else replaces it with themselves, which is a wonderful and a good thing to see happening, okay? But here's the thing. We want, like, especially if you're a Christian, like, if you're not a Christian, go to whatever service you want. You'd be like, I got privileges. You know, like, so, 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 but if you're a Christian, you're a follower of Jesus and you want to go to heaven, you'll probably think about like, you'll probably think about like maybe moving out of one of these two services because it's a missional opportunity for us to reach people who are far from God. Okay. So I just want to encourage you with that. So continue to, to, uh, to pray about that as a family and as individuals. All right, let's do what we're here for. We're here to hear from God's word and how it can change us and heal us and transform us in the ways that God wants, him to, uh, wants us to be changed. So let's go ahead and read our whole passage. Today, we're going to be zeroing in on verse 6, Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, but let's read the whole uh, sermon that Jesus has here. Here we go, starting in verse 1. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. All right, so let me tell you kind of where we are. If you're new, Grace, we're glad that you're here. So we're in the middle of a series called um, Hashtag Blessed. And what we're doing is we're comparing and contrasting uh, what the world sees as blessing to what Jesus says is blessing. And we're looking at this through Jesus' longest sermon in the Bible, right? And they're called, it's called um, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, but it also goes by the title of the Beatitudes. And the word Beatitudes simply means blessing. So as Jesus is thinking about whatever sermon that he's going to write, he doesn't write about moral issues here and there, although they're covered underneath these principles right here. He doesn't write about the, the issues of the day. He asks the question, how can my people be supremely happy, right? And so the word blessed in Greek is the word makarios. Makarios means happy, So the word blessed is equivalent to the word happy. So happiness, not just temporary happiness, not just fleeting happiness, not not happiness that's in a serial kind of relationship way. I'm happy today, but I'm going to be happy. I'm going to be upset tomorrow, and then I'll be happy again. I'll be upset tomorrow. I'll be happy again. No, no. This is happiness that lasts forever and ever and ever. So it's a forever happiness. And when Jesus talks about this forever happiness, it's not something that just happens after this life when we get all of the stuff healed inside of us. It starts in this life and then it goes on forever and ever and ever. And so as we're looking at this, today we come to verse 6, right? 
And verse 6 gives us this amazing picture of happiness. And at the end of this message, I'm going to give you a strategy for trying to figure out how to achieve happiness um, in your life, okay? And it's a strategy that's going to come right out of the scriptures and right out of Jesus' sermon here. But today we're looking at verse 6, and it says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, let's go back to this subject of happiness for a second, because again, the whole thing we're talking about is blessed. Uh, when we look at the culture, hashtag blessed means hashtag blessed, check out my amazing life. And this is what ends up happening. So for us, many of us, like the pursuit of happiness is exactly that. It is the pursuit of happiness. Never says the attainment of happiness, the acquisition of happiness, the, 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 the getting of happiness. It's always a pursuit. It's something that's off into the future. It always seems to be about an arm's length away. We see it in the distance. We go, yes, this is going to be great. And so we see the distance, and then we think, well, maybe when these other circumstances change, that's when I'm going to get happy, right? So we start really young, right? We start thinking like when we're in high school or something like that, like I'm going to work really hard, make a good grade so I can get into a good college, take the SAT rock the SATs, get into the college of my choice. And then when we get to college, we're like, man, I got to figure out how to get through college and I've got to graduate and it's fun while we're there and it's great and everything. But I, what my goal now is, is off into the distance because this is when I'm going to be happy, right? The happiness was in high school that when I get to college, college is now when I graduate, if I graduate, I'm going to be happy. That's going to be wonderful. And then we graduate and all of a sudden now we have to start paying bills and that kind of stinks. So we're like, I need somebody else to share the bills with me. So I need a relationship, right? And so we go into the situation where we're going to get a relationship where somebody can help us pay the bills and hopefully we like them and we can hang out with them. And, and so this is kind of what we do. We, we do that and then we think to ourselves, well, you know, you know, what I really need is I really need to get married. Uh, you know, that'd be awesome because you shouldn't do it the other way around. But, but, but you should do it. So I get married and you think, oh, as soon as I get married, this is going to be amazing. It's going to be incredible. We're going to get, everything's going to be like, like, we just love each other. And then, you know, as soon as that goes away, not, not that like, it's going to go away naturally. Like, it's just that, you know, marriage is like this. And so you realize, oh my gosh, I got married and that didn't fix me. And you think, well, you know what fixes you? It's having children. And uh, like you, you have children and you're like, like, because children are like just little take meters. Like, this is what they do. That's like, they're like, just take little things from you. We love our kids. They're great. It's awesome. But it's not the thing that we were looking for. They just take, 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 Happiness seems like it's an arm's length away. So what we do is we strategize because that's what we do as people. We say, all right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to set goals. And at the end of these goals, this is what's going to make me happy. So we set a bunch of goals and we get to the end of our goals. And then we realize, man, it really didn't make me as happy as I thought. So what we decide is, well, what happened was I obviously shot at the wrong goals. And so I'm going to reset some new goals, right? And hopefully these goals will be that. And then we do that ad infinitum. There's nothing wrong with doing that. There's nothing wrong with setting goals. I'm a goal setter. I love, I set goals for myself personally, set goals for our family. We set goals for the church. We measure things at the church. We measure attendance. We measure people who are getting saved, people who are getting baptized, all kinds of things. You know why? Because when you love something, you measure it. When you love something, you measure it. And you go, well, what do you mean? Well, here's what I mean. I mean, like, don't, 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 don't do this right now. Don't look at each other, okay? Like, if you're married, okay? But, 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 but like, you know how long you've been married, right? Don't, don't look at it. Like, don't, don't go. When was our anniversary? No, no, don't do that right now. Like, that's going to spoil things right now, okay? But what? So, so, so what happens, though, is you measure stuff. Why? Because it matters how long we've been together because I love her. Like, I want her to know on those special days that she's important to me, and it's important for us to, to measure these things. These are good things. But at the end of the goals that we have, they don't actually always produce happiness because we've equated the goal and the achievement of the goal with getting happiness. And this is built into the very DNA of who you are because you grew up here in this country. It's built into our national slogan. It is life, liberty, and the? It's the pursuit of happiness. This is what we do. Like we're trained from infants to be jo like happiness seekers all the time, right? This is what we do. But I don't think it works very well. And here's what I'm going to argue this morning. I'm going to argue that if you seek happiness directly, it will always be evasive. If you seek happiness directly, which all of us have been trained to do, you're never going to find that kind of happiness. Because happiness is not something to be sought directly. Happiness is a byproduct of something else that we're going to look at here in the scriptures. Right before we get there, though, I want you to see this in culture as well. 
we're not doing so well as a culture. <coughs> Excuse me. There's a, there's a report that's been out, a survey, that's released every year since 2012. And it surveys 156 countries using six different metrics, right? GDP per capita, how rich the country is. Healthy life expectancy, because, you know, it's great to be happy, but if you're happy and you die at 15, then that's, that's not good, right? The freedom to make life choices. In other words, you're not being coerced in, in your culture. Social support, family connection, I love them, they love me. Generosity, because we've discovered that generosity makes you happier, not holding on to your stuff, but giving. Perceptions of corruption in culture, too. That's also a, a metric of, of, of what they use to find out whether the country is happy or not. And despite having strong economies and low crime rates, despite scoring off the charts in some of these different areas that we just measured, the overall drop in our satisfaction and happiness has been increasing. In the last four years, we've increasingly dropped more and more and more. We're not doing well as a country in terms of the pursuit of happiness because maybe the strategy for getting happiness is not exactly working, right? So, so here, here's the thing, like, you know, I mean, honestly, uh, we are 19th, the 19th happiest nation on the planet, even though we are one of the wealthiest, even though we have the most freedom. But Finland, apparently, if you want to find a place that's happy, go to Finland, right? I, I, that doesn't sound good to me at all, you know? <laughs> Tulips are cool, but cold is bad. I'd rather be angry and warm, right? Like, just like, that's, that's, I would rather be angry and warm, really, right? So, <laughs> so one of, the, one of the challenges that we have in front of us is to figure out, like, what does the Bible teach us about this? So it says, blessed are those, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Some of your translations actually say, for they will be satisfied, so there is a way, according to the scriptures, for us to be satisfied, to be okay, to be happy, to actually have a forever happiness that starts here and goes on forever and ever and ever. But looking for it directly ends up hurting us, and the reason why is because we take all kinds of shortcuts because we think that if it feels good in the moment, then ultimately it will be satisfying to us long term. But nothing could be more uh, 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 far from the truth. And the reason what happens is for us, what, what happens to us is that we make these short-term goals, we, these short-term decisions, because we want to be happy, right? We, like happiness is right now. Happiness is in this relationship, in this situation right now. Happiness is with this job, in this situation right now. So what ends up happening is that we do these things and we invest in these small things in our life. And ultimately, over and over and over and over again, they disappoint us. Why? Because happiness is not a short-term investment. It's a long-term investment. And you cannot actually, you cannot actually find happiness by pursuing it directly. This is what the Bible says. Blessed are those, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. The idea of hungering and thirsting. Listen, if you were hungry, what do you do? You eat. Why? Because that's what we do. That's what satiates the hunger. And so he's using language that's 2,000 years old to describe a 21st century problem that we have. And that is that we hunger for something that we really can't fill ourselves with. We thirst for something, and we try to fill it with all kinds of things. We try to do that. We try to do this. We try to go in this direction. We try to go in that direction. It just doesn't end up making us happy. It doesn't end up working. And the reason for that is because you cannot pursue happiness directly. Blessed, happy forever are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For righteousness. What does that mean? Righteousness... Um, Righteousness is the picture of being like God. The word righteousness has lots of different connotations and lots of different meanings inside of it, but the idea of righteousness is that we become like God. See, you and I were created by God in this perfect, beautiful, incredible state. He created the entire world, in fact, in that state. In fact, everything in the world functioned in a perfect harmony, in a perfect balance, with perfect beauty and perfect goodness, Human beings were created not to hate one another. We were not created to be in conflict with one another. We were not created to betray one another. We were not created to be racist towards one another. We were not created to be unhappy towards each other. My job originally was to make her supremely happy, and her job was to make me supremely happy. And in making each other supremely happy, we glorified God because we became more like him. A doctrine that's not often talked about a whole lot in the church today is the supreme happiness of God himself. That when we look at God, God is not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in conflict with each other. 
There is perfect unity and perfect happiness. This God that is the Christian God that we serve is a happy God. He delights in himself. We don't even delight in ourselves anymore. And so when he says you've got to hunger and you've got to thirst for righteousness, what he means is you cannot let that hunger and thirst go because it'll just increase and increase and increase. And if you try to fill it with the wrong stuff, listen, we know that because our bodies are that way. If your body gets hungry and you fill it with chocolate, you're going to feel good for the moment. You're like, I'm happy. And then you're going to get that like post-sugar depression. Th- I'm like, I, life is terrible. I have children and people who are taken from me. No, no. Like, listen, you got you to catch this. You got to catch it. This is super important. If you hunger and thirst after happiness alone, you're going to miss it. If you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you become more like the happy God that we serve. You become more like him. We're going to talk about that in just a second, a little bit more. Look at what Psalm 1, 1 through 6 says. These are some of the most powerful passages in all of the Bible. Listen to what it says. Here it says this. Blessed. Now this is Hebrew, right? So this word blessed is the correlate to the Greek word makarios, happy forever. Blessed or happy forever is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or take a seat in the company of mockers. I I want you to see this for a second. So he says this, if you're going to be happy, we don't walk with those who are wicked. Why? Because they're not like God. Okay? So so in your mind, you might think to yourself right now, okay, well, who's really wicked? Okay, let's let's talk about that for a second. Because when we think about wicked people today, we think about like Hitler, right? And you think to yourself, man, if I was in Germany back then, I'd be the only German who's like, nah, Hitler. Not happening, you know? No, you wouldn't. You'd just be goose-stepping with everyone else, right? Why? Because, because, because we just go with the flow. As people, we just kind of follow the stream. And that was the stream of that world back then. We followed some wicked. But this, is, this, this word wicked here, this is not what this means. It means ordinary people who are pulled off track in such a way that the choices that they begin making in their own life make them look less like God. So we talked about this many, many weeks ago in another, in another series we were doing. And what I said was this. The challenge for us as Christians is that we're walking towards God is not that one day as Christians, I mean, just this is 99% of the people who are followers of Jesus. 99% of those people, you're not going to wake up one day and go, no, I tried it. I did it for a while. Didn't love it. I reject Jesus. I walk away from God. You're not going to do that most likely in your life. The statistics are completely against you doing something like that and that kind of audacity to say that, you know, we don't want Jesus anymore to reject him in that way. That's just not something that's in most of us. But you know what is in most of us? To get distracted. Oh, well, I'm on my way to Jesus, but this is really cool too. I got this career choice right now that I'm going to take right now and because I got to pour all my time into this. I no longer have time for church. I no longer have time for faith. And really, once you put church church out, you put faith out, you put Jesus out, you put God out. And so I'm not going to say goodbye like I don't like you anymore and I don't like your Jesus. I'm just going to say I like something else a little bit better. I'm just a little bit distracted. And um, I call that spiritual drift. Spiritual drift. It's not an intentional conscious decision to reject God. It's an intentional conscious decision to love something else more than you love him in the moment. And what ends up happening is that as we spiritually drift in life, we just start following the crowd, you know? Everyone else is doing it. Yeah, it's cool. So now we're walking in the way of the wicked, and we don't even know it. We've just embraced the culture around us. Do you think people in Germany are worse people than we are? They're not. They just follow the spirit of the age. And they walked wickedly. But notice these three words. Just look like in verse, in verse 1, three words that I underlined. They walk in step with the wicked. They stand in the way of sinners. This is, this, is, this is what this means. It means now, like, you get a little bit more comfortable. You're walking with them. Now I'm, stand, I'm planted with them. We're hanging out. And eventually, we're sitting down together. It increasingly becomes more and more comfortable as you walk with the wicked. It doesn't become increasingly less comfortable. It becomes more comfortable. And so now we're standing. And I just want to give you, like, personal wisdom right now, just, just a thing here. You can reject it if you want. Just as a brother as a spiritual father for some of you, I want you to think about this. For 30 years I've walked with Jesus. 
if you stand with sinners, if you say, these are my people, it's going to implode your life. And this is what I mean by that. You guys know that uh, if you've been around here a long time, you know my heart is for, I mean, because I didn't grow up in the church. And so someone like you, sitting in seats in a different church, listening to different messages from a different pastor, heard a similar message, and you came running after a guy like me. And the only reason why I'm a Christian today is because of that. So you know that mission is important. Mission matters. We have to spend time with people who are far from God. But if those people who are far from God are your inner circle, eventually you're going to walk with the wicked. Eventually you're going to stand with them. And then eventually you're going to sit and you're going to be really comfortable in that world. I want to challenge you. And here's what we're going to do at the very end. I'm going to give you a way of walking out this righteousness. I'm going to show you kind of how to do that in a very practical way. And then I'm going to challenge you at the end of the message. But one of the things I want to challenge you right now with is that if your inner circle are filled with people who do not follow Jesus, you will walk in the way of the wicked one day. And one day, one day, you will be so comfortable with them that you will sit with them. But look at what verse 2 says. But, but, but. Now, if you don't do that, who's the... But whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night, that person is like a tree by streams of water. <coughs> so this is what it's saying right there. So the psalmist is saying this. He's saying, listen, if you fill your life with the counsel of the wicked, you will eventually become the wicked. You know this because if you have children and when they're really, really young and you got a kid that's super misbehaving and just not so good, you're going to say, hey, maybe we shouldn't be hanging out with Johnny right now. Maybe Johnny's going to grow up and be a serial killer. So we're going to try to, like, we're going to, try to keep you away from Johnny right now because we love you. That's, we're, you're important to us. You matter. If that's true for our children, how much more so it is, it is for us as well. But like, listen, I want you to check this out. So, so what ends up happening here is if we walk with the wicked, we will eventually become the wicked. And, and he says here, but contrast that with if you let God's word wash over you, if you put God's word on the inside of your heart, here's what happens. Not that you meditate day and night, just all, Lord, I'm praying for it. You know, I'm just, I'm trying, I got to do this thing. No, no, no. It's not like that at all. When you put God's word inside of you, here's what happens. Throughout the day, it comes back to you. Because you're going to see circumstances. You're going to go, here's what, the, here's what the word says about that. You're going to see a situation and God's wisdom will come to you in that moment because the role of the Holy Spirit is to remind you of everything that he said. And so here the psalmist is telling us that, that we're going to delight in the law of the Lord. And that, that, that word law there, it simply means the scriptures of the Old Testament. And of course the ones in the New Testament. But that person will be like a tree planted next to streams of water. Have you ever been planted next to streams of water? It's a good season because you're attached to that which nourishes you, your family, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, people who teach you, people who guide you, people who lead you, your, people who are connected to Jesus. A tree that's next to a stream of water grows up robust. It's beautiful. Its leaves are wonderful. Its branches are strong. All parts of it are healthy. And it yields its fruit in season. That means it does what it was required by God to do. Like, Every tree has a season, and it, not every tree, but trees that fruit have seasons, and they fruit at that time. Otherwise, they're kind of useless. In fact, Jesus, in the, in, the, in, in the New Testament, Jesus actually curses a fig tree because in season, it didn't produce anything. He's like, what's the point of the fig tree if it doesn't produce figs? It's not that pretty of a tree. So he curses it. It dies. Look at, look at this. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither and whose leaf does not wither. Guys, your families, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, the city of Orlando, and some of us in the room, this ancient language is describing the reality for us right now. Our leaves are withering. Like, we're not healthy. We're not attached to that which has given us life. Things are becoming withered. I want you to think about something, because... In the one, on the one hand, the Bible says and teaches us that we are irretrievably broken. That's what sin is inside of us. It, it is irretrievable brokenness. We can get healthier and we can become more righteous and become more like God for sure. And we can reverse the effects of some of this sin. But at the end of the day, none of us is ever going to get to the moral position where we just become sinless. We'll need Jesus for that when we see him face to face. The other 
truth and tension that Christianity has is that while we are irretrievably broken, we are extraordinarily glorious. So, I don't know, I guess it was like last year when Notre Dame burned. Did you see that? It was terrible, right? We're actually going to France in May, which we're really excited about. And I want to see that. It's going to be an incredible, an incredible thing. But it would have been better to see it beforehand. I remember watching the video. Pastor Rick and I were actually at lunch, and something came across and sent that. And I watched it burn, and just tears, you know, streaming down my face because I was like, here's this beautiful, incredible, glorious cathedral. And it's just burning. Now, what was really interesting was that many, many days later, like weeks later, you can, you can see Notre Dame, and on the inside it was just charred and destroyed, but it still retained some of its original beauty. There were still some spires that, that, that hung in there. There was a beautiful, giant, big uh, glass window, like a stained glass window that was there, and it survived the fire. See, this is the condition that we find ourselves in right now. On the one hand, we've been burned, and it's going to be very, very difficult for it to be restored. It's going to take an artisan's hand, and it's going to take the master's touch. But eventually, they're going to restore Notre Dame to its original beauty and glory. But because someone who has specialized skill is going to be able to come in and fix that. But here's the thing. You right now, you and I, we are broken images of God, but we were created as a cathedral to reflect the glory and the majesty of God. So these two Christian truths are always held in tension with one another. On the one hand, we're irretrievably broken. On the other, we still retain some of the original beauty and glory that God created us with. We were not meant to be broken down trees. We were not meant to be trees that are destroyed because our leaves have withered and we become nothing. But it says that person The glorious person, the righteous person, is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. You are not created to be that way. You are created to be like God who is supremely happy, filled with joy. Sometimes people think it's trivial for us to long for happiness. It is not. Because the Bible says this, that our leaves are not to wither and whatever we do will prosper. And you know what that means, right? It means that whatever we do that is in righteousness, in gloriousness, in the direction of God, God will make that thing prosper. And I want you to think about that for a second because the implications are this, that when I become like God and I have God's heart and I have God's activities and I have God's actions and I begin to change things inside my life and God begins to change me from the inside out, what ends up happening is I become more happy. I become more joyful. And as a result, people around me are blessed by what God is pouring into me. Why? Because God watches over me just like he watches over you. And the more I give of the brokenness that is irretrievably broken, and the more I give him that and say, God, fill this space, the master comes and he begins recreating it until he finishes it when we see him face to face. But we're being changed into his likeness, being changed into glory. I want you to see the practical ramifications of that. When you are like him, you're blessed. Now, here's the thing. That blessing doesn't just stop with you. It it flows over into the life of all the people who are around you as well. Listen, my children, my children get to go to heaven, not because their pastor, their dad's a pastor. There's no freebies. My kids get to go to heaven because I taught them the gospel. My kids get to go to heaven because someone taught me the gospel. And all the goodness that God has poured into my life, I've poured out into their life. They're little sinners, no doubt. (laughs) But they have goodness that I didn't have when I was a kid. And they'll take that and they'll give goodness to their children one day. And that righteousness goes on and on and on. The Bible says to a thousand generations. This is who we are. This is not aspirational. This is descriptive. But watch this. Not so with the wicked, it says. Not so with the wicked. They're like chaff. That's a dead tree. Chaff or tumbleweeds that that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in judgment nor the sinners in the assembly of the righteous. One day God will assemble his church. We will all be there if we trust Christ with our life. And the unrighteous will not be there. It's one of the saddest verses. 
But look at what it says, guys. If it's not clear yet, verse 6, for the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. It doesn't say that he watches over the way of everyone. It says that the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. Not the perfect, but the one who is taking steps toward him. The one who is righteous. The one who is becoming like him. But the way of the wicked leads to destruction. I don't want the people around me that I love so much to end up in destruction. These are real things. And I want my family to be blessed. I want our church to be blessed. I want the people in the... I pray for you guys all the time that we would be more righteous. James 4, 1 and 2, up on the screen, gives us some insight into this. It says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from the desires that battle within you? So, so here's what he's describing. He's describing something that um, happened inside of you when you became a Christian. So you have this old heart, and you have this new heart, right, as a Christian. This old heart generates sin. It's a sin and idol generator. This is what it does. You know this because every once in a while, you know, even in the great hymn, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, right? You and I have this tendency just to be like, I'm going to become something different. Like, I'm going to walk away from God. I'm going to drift. And then you have this other thing inside you that says, no, no, no. And this is more than conscience. This other thing inside you that says, no, no, I want, I, want, I want to be like God. And so you have the freedom and the power to determine which heart you're going to listen to, right? As a non-believer, all I had was this old broken down heart, which was to self-satisfy myself in whatever way I wanted. We know what that was like. We looked for happiness in every place and didn't find it because it was elusive, because it's a byproduct of righteousness, not because we can find it. This is what Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, and this is why we pursue happiness. He, God, God, has made everything beautiful in its time. He's also set eternity in the human heart. This is why we seek for happiness, because everything material that we have in the world cannot satisfy something that is immaterial, a desire that God placed inside of us, one for eternity. But I love what it says right there. He has made, not he will make, everything beautiful in its time. This means that God has already determined the time for your brokenness that the brokenness will be healed, that the brokenness will be changed, or that the brokenness will be destroyed when you see him face to face. This is why it's not a dumb slogan that we use around here all the time to say that good is ahead. It is a fundamental eschatological reality for us. One day, things will change and we'll be okay. Isaiah 55 uh, verses 2 and 3 says, well, you know, if that's true, then why are we wasting our time right now? Verse 2, why we spend money on what is not bread and labor on what does not satisfy? What a great question. And why am I doing some of the things that I'm doing right now? Listen, listen, listen to me. And eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest affair, right? So what, how do I do that? I give ear to God. I come to him. I listen. Why? Because I want to live. I want to live. I want to live well. Jeremiah 2:12 12 uh, says this. <coughs> My people have committed two evils. Right? Now, this, of course, was to uh, Israel in the, in, the, in the original context, but it also applies to us. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me. They've drifted. The fountain of living waters. I'm the fountain of living waters, God says. I'll give you, like a tree planted next to a river, everything you need to thrive and become beautiful and glorious. But instead, here's what you guys have done. You've hewed out cisterns for yourselves. Remember, Christianity is in a Middle Eastern religion. We, we tend to think of it as a, a Western religion that started in the Middle East. So this is a desert, arid region. In order to find water, you build way deep to hit water table, and then you fill that in with rock, and then you put a big wooden thing on top of it, right? And sometimes these wells would last for generations and give generations of people water. But he's saying this, you guys, you guys build, you guys are trying to satisfy yourself. And so what you're doing is instead of building good wells that will provide water for you forever, spiritual nourishment forever, you build broken cisterns. And so when you go in and you get your water, it's filled and clouded and messy, it doesn't actually nourish you. It doesn't make whole. He's like, come to me. I am the fountain of living water. Stop with the strategy of brokenness. And so here's what I want you to do. Um, I want you to see something really cool. And this is how we're going to end this whole thing. I want you to see something really cool Jesus did in his sermon. Jesus is the ultimate sermon guy because he's God. He's got an edge. And, uh, and yet he does this incredible thing right now. I told you that in verse 6 today is the linchpin. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for they will be filled they will be satisfied, okay? The, ver the three verses that come before it and the three verses that come after it actually give us an insight on how to become righteous. Here we go. So these are the verses that we've already looked at. Blessed are the poor in spirit. We talked about this. Being poor in spirit simply means that we're not going to walk around being pri uh, prideful. So 
Verse one, or verse three, rather, we have to empty ourselves of pridefulness, right? The next one, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Many of us don't believe that we'll ever be comforted. We go through sorrow and suffering. We believe that suffering is the last word. So we have to empty ourselves of that disbelief, that unbelief, and say, no, no, God will one day restore me. God will heal me. He'll transform me. And then verse number five, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And we said that, you know what meekness is? Meekness is not weakness. What meekness is? Meekness is a kind of stability that you have a rootedness. You're not moved or swayed by the circumstances of the world around you. And so we have to empty ourselves of worry about the world around us. So the first three things tell us these things. They tell us what we have to lose in order to be righteous. We have to empty ourselves of certain things. And that is one half of the tension of what it means to be righteous. One half of the tension is I've got to get rid of some things in my life. And right now, the Holy Spirit, right now the Holy Spirit will give you exactly what that is. All you have to do is ask the Holy Spirit, what do I need to empty myself of right now, God? And probably, even as I was talking about this, some of you went, I know what that is. Because the Holy Spirit's been talking to me about it for a long time. Now, we have the verse that we're looking at today. Right? Verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they'll be filled. We have desires that need to be filled. Right? So go to the next... These are going to be the next three weeks, right? Blessed are the merciful. So now it's not about what I need to empty myself out of. Now it's what I need to be filled with. Blessed are we because we are merciful people. We don't get online and, and scream at people because of their political differences. We don't get online and yell at people because they, they differ with us. That's not what we do. Blessed are the pure in heart. In other words, we have primacy of purpose right? We're filled, we're filled with singularity. We're going to do something really cool that weekend, actually, to illustrate that. Blessed are the peacemakers, so this thing culminates with us being people of peace. Again, we don't, we don't enter into the, the, we don't walk behind, we don't walk in the way of sinners. We don't, we don't walk in the way of the wicked, stand in the place of sinners, and sit in the seat of scoffers. Why? Because we are peacemakers. See, the first three verses before verse six were all about what I need to get rid of. The next three that we're going to look at are what I need to be filled with, right? And so here's my challenge to you as we go. What do you need to stop doing? What do you need to start doing? Because we're going to want, this is the tension of the Christian faith. This is what we do. Righteousness means there are certain things that we have to let go of. And here's the reason why. If you don't let go of them, you're not going to be able to take your next step. If you don't let go of these things, you're going to be continually drawn back to the same old patterns and old brokenness from the past. Because we don't. The Bible calls that a foothold. The devil has a foothold. So what are the things that we need to stop doing? What are the things that we need to get rid of? Secondly, the Bible never talks about you as a person who is just empty. It always talks about you as being filled. Filled with the Spirit. Filled with virtue. Filled with different things, right? So we're not going to be empty. Empty is not the goal, but we have to empty ourselves first. And then we have to ask ourselves, what do we have to start doing? So the first question, what do I have to stop doing? Second question, what do I have to start doing? And that tension that we live in, that constant thing of what do I have to stop doing? What do I have to start doing? Enables us to be able to walk the road of righteousness. The road of righteousness leads us to the road of happiness. It's no longer the pursuit of happiness. It is the byproduct of righteousness. I'm not looking for something out there. I'm finding it because God's making me a different person. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we just ask right now that you would speak to us deeply about the things that we are called to let go of. <coughs> we ask, God, that you would fill us with the things you want us to be filled with so we don't always have to walk around, God, just wondering what our next step is. So we're not blindly asking the question, what do I need to do to be righteous? Father, show us what we need to let go of. Let us not be stuck in the past and the brokenness of our, our, our choices. But God, let us be, walk, be able to walk in freedom because we gave everything over to you. And then lastly, God, what do we need to fill ourselves with? Please fill us, God. Help us to be the people that you've called us to be, God. We want so desperately not to just be pursuing happiness our whole life. We don't want it to just be elusive all the time. But we want to find it, God. And the way that we find it is by being changed into your likeness, the happy God that we serve. It's in your name we pray. Amen.